Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Gary Blumenschein, uh, Chairman of the, the Department of History at Indiana University, Purdue University at Fort Wayne. And I'd like to welcome you to the Distinguished Lecture Series of the School of Arts and Sciences of Indiana Purdue Fort Wayne. This evening, uh, the School of Arts and Sciences, with the support of the Addison Locke Roach Memorial Lecture Fund of Indiana University, is pleased to present Dr. Jeffrey Parker, a fellow of the British Academy, and Charles E. Noel, Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Before I introduce uh, Dr. Parker, I would like to thank a number of people who have uh, made this evening possible. First of all, the Addison Locke Roach Memorial Lecture Fund of Indiana University provided a generous grant to support the appearance in Fort Wayne of Professor Parker. And I would like to thank Dr. Evangelos Kufudakis, my old colleague and friend, who uh, greatly assisted us in approaching this uh, lecture fund in Bloomington. Uh, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, Dr. David Cox, uh, has offered both warm personal support and real financial backing for this event uh, through its planning and uh, fruition. Members of the Departments of uh, History and Modern Foreign Languages, uh, who the departments that are this evening's hosts, have been uniformly supportive of this venture. And finally, uh, the steady and careful supervision of numerous details by Barbara Blauvelt, Secretary of the Departments of History and Political Science, has facilitated this evening in very many concrete ways. And I would like to thank her and uh, all the other people, including Professor Mary Helen Tente, who hosted a number of us to a lovely uh, dinner before this lecture this evening. So I thank all of those people. As Professor Parker is the, this semester's distinguished lecturer, I should now like to invite our Dean David Cox to present uh, a small token to him of this evening. Thank you, Gary, both for giving me the podium and for seeing to it that Professor Parker gets here. Having sat in on Professor Parker's seminar this afternoon and having done my very best to monopolize him over dinner, I can guarantee you a treat, which I will not delay any longer than necessary. However, uh, a short delay is necessary because, as most of you know, from time to time the School of Arts and Sciences designates a distinguished lecturer. And we have, by action of the faculty, so designated Professor Parker. And I'll disappear for a minute here. And retrieve a plaque, which Professor Parker will take with him. And I'll show you later, you will also leave a visible trace of your visit in the form of a unengraved plate on the permanent stay-at-home plaque. We're very pleased to have you, and you honor us by being here as our distinguished lecturer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Academic humanists and scholars at North American conferences in recent years have noticed the effect of Mrs. Thatcher's brain drain on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, it has been very difficult to keep rising young scholars at their straightened posts in England when greater facilities and resources are available here or in Canada. Uh, this brain drain carries over even to the most important English scholars of our age. One of the most important of the immigrant historians trained in England and posted during his early career in Britain is tonight's speaker, Professor Jeffrey Parker. A native of Nottingham and a first class honors graduate of Cambridge University, Jeffrey Parker continued his graduate studies at Cambridge under Professor John Eliot, a leading historian of 16th century Spain, and completed his PhD in 1968. He then became a fellow of Christ College, Cambridge, for four years before taking an academic post at St. Andrews University in Scotland, where he rose to the position of Professor of Early Modern History in 1982 after having been awarded the Doctor of Letters by Cambridge for his publications in Early Modern European History. Looking for a super historian, as one distinguished member of the department at Illinois put it to me one day, Dr. Parker was lured in 1986 from the wind and the rain of the North Sea coast of Scotland to the cornfields of central Illinois, where, not unimportantly, 
is located one of the finest research libraries on earth. Dr. Parker's books have drawn wide attention and praise since his first major contribution, The Army of Flanders and the Spanish Road, 1567 to 1659, The Logistics of Spanish Victory and Defeat in the Low Countries War, published in 1972. Thereafter, nine more books have emerged from his computer, uh, volumes which uh, blend political and military history into the social, geographic, and institutional framework of early modern times. Among them are the Spanish Armada, which for 14 weeks was on the British bestseller charts during the anniversary year of 1988, and the Military Revolution, published in 1988, and awarded the Best Book of the Year Prize by the American Military Institute and the Dexter Prize by the Society for the History of Technology for the best book appearing between 1987 and 1990. The editor of seven other books on early modern history and geography, the author of many scholarly and general articles, Dr. Parker has had conferred on him the Encomienda de la Orden de Isabel la Católica in 1988 by His Majesty the King of Spain, and in 1990, the Free University of Brussels granted him an honorary Doctor of Letters. We are pleased to present this evening, in commemoration of the Columbian voyage 500 years ago, Dr. Jeffrey Parker to speak about After Columbus, Spain's struggle for Atlantic hegemony after 1492. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Parker to Fort Wayne. Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Thank you very much for your kind words. It's very nice to be introduced by a PhD of my new university. And thank you to Dean Cox for that very handsome and totally unexpected uh, plaque. I felt like kissing it when I saw it, but then I remembered Hubert Humphrey in the television set in 1968 and decided it was a bad precedent. So, the lecture tonight uh, is not quite about Columbus. Uh, I know that our transatlantic focus just now is concentrated on the invasion of the Americas by groups of Europeans in the service of Spain in and immediately after the year 1492. I know also that their achievement was most remarkable. Within a generation, by a combination of force, treachery and luck, they had established effective control over two million square kilometers of the New World, an area four times as large as the peninsula from which most of them came, and over a population of some 20 million, seven times the population of their own land. In addition, and equally remarkable, the Spaniards turned the ocean connecting southern Europe with the Caribbean into a Spanish lake. The next generation of invaders did almost as well. The frontiers of European occupation were steadily advanced, even though the native population contained within them inexorably declined, and in the wake of Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe, the Pacific too became a Spanish lake. This was the rich legacy of Columbus's epic voyage. I'm now going to reduce the lighting because I would like to show some slides. In this atlas, prepared for Prince Philip of Spain in 1542, that's to say just half a century after Columbus, the year of the new laws protecting Native Americans against their Spanish overlords. The cosmographer Giovanni Battista Agnesi gave preeminence to the nautical achievements of the conquistadores. You'll see on that map there are two lines, one of which goes round the world, the other of which simply goes from the Caribbean back to Spain. They are the only two details of human geography to be included on the map of the Spanish world. The sea route to the New World and back, and Magellan's itinerary around the globe. At the time, 1542, both were Hispanic monopolies. But by the time of the first centenary, in 1592, Columbus's legacy had been largely lost for Spain's Atlantic hegemony was clearly shattered. It is true that there had been some further spectacular additions 
most notably the conquest of the Philippines in the 1570s and the acquisition of Portugal and her entire overseas empire in 1580, creating, quite literally, and for the first time in history, an empire upon which the sun never set. But by 1592 it was an empire under siege. An English force under the command of Francis Drake, known to Spain as that notorious pirate and to the rest of us as that heroic pioneer of the cause of freedom, <laughs> made a leisurely circumnavigation between 1577 and 1581, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake and returning with a hundred tons of Spanish silver and a hundred pounds of Spanish gold. In 1585, the same Drake led a far larger fleet to the Caribbean and sacked Cartagena, Santo Domingo and St. Augustine. And between 1589 and 1591, no less than 235 English ships sailed to the Caribbean and back, taking by force what they were not offered by trade. In the following decades there were more circumnavigations, more raids to the Caribbean, and more attacks on Spain's overseas colonies by her European enemies. While the rest of her transatlantic trade could only take place under the escort of flotillas so numerous that their cost undermined profits to the point where the trade itself began to atrophy. Worst of all, permanent settlements of English, French, Dutch and eventually Swedes and Germans sprang up along the entire eastern seaboard of the New World. Now of course not all of these developments were of equal importance because not all parts of the continent were of equal value. The Deep South, what is now southern Argentina and southern Chile, was really only useful as a staging post on the arduous westward route to Asia, while the far north was hardly worth having at all. Not for nothing did the European explorers adopt for it the native word which they encountered most often, Canada. It's worth nothing. <laughs> Even the Pacific seaboard of North America was of questionable value. As late as 1848, in the wake of President Polk's Mexican War, many Americans felt that, and I quote, the impenetrable mountains and dry, narrow valleys of California and the trackless, treeless and utterly uninhabitable New Mexico, end quote, were not worth having and were certainly not worth the $15 million that Mr. Polk had paid for them. You can imagine this lecture is a real blast when I go to California. <laughs> it's true that the Atlantic seaboard between the 37th and the 42nd parallel, roughly from Roanoke to Manhattan, were of great potential value, possessing both a favorable climate and relative proximity to England and the Netherlands. But the formidable bulk of the Appalachians, to say nothing of the tenacious opposition of the Indian nations in the region, made settlement in depth extremely difficult. No, the parts of America that were worth having in the 16th and 17th century were precisely those parts acquired by the Iberian powers. From the River Plate to Florida in the east and from the River Bio Bio to Baja California in the west. And there, any attempt to challenge the Iberian monopoly was ruthlessly stifled. It was noticeable, however, that the preservation of Spain's monopoly required increasing effort. Despite a stream of royal decrees ordering an increase in both the quantity and the size of ships laid down in the yards of Cantabria, so that between 1550 and 1570, Spain doubled its Atlantic tonnage, this shipbuilding program did not include the construction of ocean-going warships capable of operating effectively on the high seas. Even the galleons, specially constructed to escort the merchant convoys sailing to and from America, were equipped with only a single gun deck and were therefore not frontline warships. They were clearly incapable of dealing with the French expedition to Florida in 1565 which involved a much larger force and aimed at permanent settlement. And Philip II, King of Spain, was therefore forced to commandeer merchant ships and supply them with ordnance, munitions and soldiers. But in the end, it was sufficient. 25 armed merchantmen, 
commanded by Philip II's most successful high seas admiral, Pedro Menendez de Aviles, was all it took. The French settlers were attacked, persuaded to surrender, and massacred. This stunning blow, plus the long and unhappy sequence of religious wars, ended France's presence in the Americas for half a century. And by the time she tried again with Champlain and Dumont, Spain had already forfeited her hegemony in this continent. And she had forfeited it to the far smaller, far less significant, and far less wealthy England. Precisely how Columbus's legacy was lost in the 1570s and the 1580s through Spain's own misguided ambition and technical incompetence is the main subject of my lecture to you tonight. The story begins in 1553 and 1554 with the successful negotiations of the Emperor Charles V to marry his son and heir, Philip, to Mary Tudor, Queen of England. There they are, the happy pair with two little dogs. Of course, they're spaniels. This diplomatic and dynastic coup created a powerful new Habsburg constellation in northern Europe. For the emperor also rules Spain. On most British maps, everything pink is British. On Habsburg's maps, it's always purple. And everything purple that you see on that map belonged to Charles V. Spain, much of Italy, the 17 provinces of the Netherlands, the free county of Burgundy, and the conquest, excuse me, the acquisition of England completed the encirclement in France. It was the diplomatic coup of the century. But in November 1558, after scarcely five years of wedlock, Mary died, childless, and the English crown passed to her half-sister Elizabeth, who soon showed unmistakable signs of wishing to turn England Protestant again. At first, Philip, whose title King of England lapsed with his wife's death, tried to recover his position by matrimony, albeit with singularly little enthusiasm, even for a Habsburg. In January 1559, and I quote, feeling like a condemned man wondering what is to become of him, he asked for Elizabeth's hand in marriage, but only, he emphasized, quote, to serve God and to see if this might prevent that lady from making the changes in religion that she has in mind. Believe me, he told his ambassador in London, if it were not for God's sake, I would never do this. <laughs> Nothing could or would make me do this except the clear knowledge that it might gain the kingdom of England for his service and faith. In the end, of course, Elizabeth rejected her unhappy suitor and Philip promptly began to think of alternative strategies for preserving England for the Catholic faith. In a confidential holograph letter written in March 1559, he wrote, It grieves me to see what is happening over there in England and to be unable to take the steps to stop it that I want, while the steps I can take seem far milder than such a great evil deserves. But at the moment, I lack the resources to do anything. Later in this letter, the king was returned to his point in a more forceful and calculating way. The evil that is taking place in that kingdom, he writes, has caused me the anger and confusion I have mentioned. But we must try to remedy it without involving me or any of my vassals in a declaration of war until we have enjoyed the benefits of peace for a while. So here we have clear evidence that Philip II recognized the need to use force against Elizabethan England from virtually the beginning of his reign. Moreover, at this time, there was a good chance that firm measures might have succeeded. Support for Protestantism was largely limited to the southeast, with most English folk elsewhere, and more important, most of their political masters, apparently content to remain subject to the papacy. There is no evidence of spontaneous enthusiasm for the change of religion in 1559-60 to 60, except in the home counties. But two considerations ruled out immediate implementation. First, after eight years of continuous war against both England, uh, against both France and the Turks, Philip II's treasury in the spring of 1559 was empty 
and the funds to mount a major invasion of England were simply not available. Second and more serious, Philip himself had but a distant claim to the English throne. The next in succession, after Elizabeth, according to most observers, was Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, and she was, at this stage, even less acceptable to Spain than Elizabeth Tudor. On the one hand, Mary's Catholic credentials were also open to question, because although she subsequently played the role of a post-Tridentine martyr to perfection, it was a late development. In the 1560s, while she ruled Scotland, most of her ministers were Protestants, and she even married a Protestant, Bothwell, according to the Protestant rite in a Protestant church. On the other hand, and perhaps worse in the eyes of Philip II, Mary Stuart was a French princess. Her mother was French, she was brought up in France, and she married in France. Indeed, she didn't just marry an ordinary Frenchman, she married the King of France, Francis II. And together they style themselves unambiguously, and here you see their shield. Francis and Mary, sovereigns of France, Scotland, England and Ireland. Let me see if I can pick that out for you. If you start at the top right, Franciscus et Maria, DGRR, Franco, Scot, Anglia et Hiber. Not a happy thought, if you're Elizabeth Tudor. And even after Francis's death, Mary Stuart remained French to the core. She wrote almost all her letters in French, indeed she didn't write an English letter until 1568, and in her will of 1566, all of the first seven beneficiaries were her French relatives. Small wonder that Philip II could see no advantage in toppling the Tudor regime for the benefit of Mary Stuart and her French relatives. So although many native plots were hatched against Elizabeth in the early years of her reign, none of them attracted Spanish support. But in 1567, a group of Scottish nobles rebelled against Mary and imprisoned her. No big cause, she just murdered one husband and married another. It happened all the time in the 16th century, but the Scots were sensitive on these issues and they imprisoned her. And in May 1568, she managed to escape uh, tried a battle, lost it, which also happened very frequently in Scotland, and rode into England to seek the support of her apparently friendly and supportive cousin, Elizabeth Tudor. It was, of course, the biggest mistake of her life, because Elizabeth promptly imprisoned her while the charge of murder was disposed of, uh, which it never was, kept her confined until 19 years later. Uh, Mary Stuart was executed on a royal warrant at Fothering Hay in Northamptonshire. From the, Mary, the moment Mary Stuart crossed the border, in spring 1568, the uneasy truce between Protestant England and Catholic Spain was over. The real turning point in Anglo-Spanish relations came, I think, in 1570, when Philip II lent his support to the plot of a Florentine adventurer, Roberto Ridolfi, and a group of English Catholics aimed at the removal of the Queen in favour of Mary Stuart. The King promised to dispatch a flotilla from Spain to the North Sea, where it would convoy 10,000 troops drawn from the Spanish forces stationed in the Netherlands across to the coast of England to coincide with the Catholic uprising. In the event, the conspiracy was detected and the conspirators was destroyed before they could act. But the extent of Spain's participation in the Ridolfi plot was fully revealed. A letter written by Elizabeth's chief minister, William Cecil Lord Burley, in September 1571, made it clear that the Queen already knew all about Mary's plans to escape and flee to Spain, where she would marry her son James to Philip II's daughter. And above all, that she knew all about Mary's, quote, labours and devices to stir up a new rebellion in this realm of England and to have the King of Spain assist it. So from that point on, not only was Philip involved in attempts to destroy Mary, uh, Elizabeth Tudor, but Elizabeth Tudor knew, knew all about it. On the one hand, she never trusted Spain again. On the other, she sanctioned new defence spending, both on the Royal Navy and on coastal fortifications, and she openly welcomed and succoured rebels against Philip, whether in the Netherlands, in America, 
or after the Spanish annexation of 1580 in Portugal. She also tolerated and sometimes directly supported privateering activity against Spanish interests. No less than 11 major English expeditions sailed to the Caribbean between 1572 and 1577, plundering Spanish property and killing Spanish subjects. Naturally, Philip II took this badly, but his hands were tied. For, for soon after the failure of the Ridolfi plot, the Netherlands, the designated launching pad for Spain's army of liberation, erupted in revolt. The rebels managed to entrench themselves in the maritime provinces of Holland and Zealand, and despite some spectacular military successes, it soon became obvious that final victory in the Low Countries depended upon securing command of the North Sea. Accordingly, in February 1574, the king signed orders to create a war fleet based on Santander, quote, both to clear the western coasts and the channel of pirates, i.e. English, and to recapture some ports in the Netherlands occupied by the rebels. Pedro Menéndez de Aviles, the victor of Florida, was placed in command. The following month, however, March 1574, Philip's frustration at the aid provided to the rebels by both, England, by both Elizabeth and the French Protestants led him to transform both the scale and the aims of this maritime operation. Orders were now issued for the embargo of 224 merchant ships from which Menendez was to choose his task force and a total of 11,000 men were to be made ready. Their goal was first to attack England, either by a direct assault or else via Ireland, and also, if possible, to destroy the Protestant pirate bases on the west coast of France, before going on to recapture the Dutch strongholds in the Netherlands. Now this, of course, was just plain stupid. Simply to locate and load the artillery and other requir equipment required to turn a merchantman, required to turn a merchantman into a fighting ship took months, and for such a huge undertaking, as Menendez and several of, several of Philip II's councillors pointed out, quote, it could take years. Sure enough, by September 1574, the great fleet for the conquest of England, Ireland, the west of France and the rebellious Dutch provinces hadn't even been collected into a single port, and worse still, many of the men assembled, including Pedro Menendez, had died of plague. So, with regret, the king admitted defeat and ordered the fleet to be stood down. He'd squandered half a million ducats. Far more seriously, he had publicly demonstrated the limits of Spain's naval capacity in the Atlantic. Eventually, it's true, the following year, some 50 vessels carrying troops did leave Spain, causing near panic in England as they sailed towards the Channel. But they were under strict orders to sail direct to the Netherlands, and even then some of the crews mutinied and demanded a return to Spain, while others ran aground on the coast of Flanders. The Dutch revolt continued. For a full decade after this fiasco, the king confined himself, rather like Elizabeth, to indirect attacks. He lent support to a papal plan to invade southwest Ireland and foment a major rebellion against English rule. And in 1580, the 800, uh, the 800 Spanish and Italian volunteers who landed at Smerwick in County Kerry sailed in Spanish ships from a Spanish port. But Philip II was able to claim, when challenged, that they sailed under papal aegis and had nothing to do with him. Just as that same year, the Queen could assert that Drake had circumnavigated the world and plundered Spanish possessions entirely without her knowledge or consent. At just this moment, 1580, possession of the Portuguese Empire was thrown wide open by the death of the last legitimate male member of the House of Avish, leaving Philip II as the closest male heir. In the course of 1580, thanks to a brilliant combined operation, all of mainland Portugal was occupied and orders were issued for all overseas possessions to recognize Philip II as their lawful ruler. The king's dominions now formed a continuous chain around the globe, from the Iberian Peninsula, through the Americas and the Philippines, to Macau, Malacca, Portuguese India and Ceylon, and back via Mozambique and Angola to the Mediterranean. 
Moreover, apart from the wealth and resources of the Portuguese Empire, Philip II gained an Atlantic battle fleet. The ten huge fighting galleons constructed in the 1570s by the Portuguese crown for the defense of their seaborne trade, together with the great natural harbor of Lisbon in which to station it. Apart from the Royal Navy, Elizabeth's own fleet, which at the time numbered scarcely 20 fighting ships, the Portuguese squadron was the best battle fleet in the Western world. Its qualities were soon demonstrated. Only the Azores had refused to recognize the Spanish succession, and in 1582 an expeditionary force of 60 ships, led by the Royal Galleons and commanded by the resourceful and experienced Marquis of Santa Cruz, sailed forth from Lisbon and destroyed the rebel fleet, assisted by French and English vessels, in a battle. Now only the island of Terceira held out, and in 1583 an even larger armada, consisting of 98 ships and over 15,000 men, and again commanded by Santa Cruz, carried out a skillful combined operation and reconquered this last post of defiance. These events caused a sensation in Spain. There was frenzied rejoicing in the streets, and according to a disgusted foreign ambassador, some Spaniards were so moved by their euphoria that they claimed that even Christ was no longer safe in paradise, for the Marquis might go there to bring him back and crucify him all over again. You wonder about the force of counter-reformation Catholicism, that isn't it. Nor was celebration confined to verbal hyperbole. A bowl commemorating the Tercera landings, this very bowl here, found among the wreckage of one of the Armada vessels that founded off Ireland, shows Spain's warrior patron saint with new attributes. I wonder, I think I'm just going to switch the lights right off for a second. Well, I think I am. No. Don't think I can do that. Oh, never mind. Just allow your eyes to focus, because this bowl, apart from being an actual relic of the Armada, and therefore something which we know was made before 1588, and yet after 1583, is of some interest. It is, of course, a St. James. You can see the horse. Let's see if I can assist you a little bit here. You can see the horse, and there's St. James with his cape flowing, his arm with the sword. There's the horse, St. James. But the sword arm is not raised against cowering moors. It's raised against the waves of the ocean sea, now subdued by Spain, along with the human enemies who sought refuge among them. It's the new aim of Spain. This is the new dynamic. Even Santa Cruz, now appointed captain general of the ocean sea, was affected and members of his entourage began to say, quote, openly, that now that we have Portugal, England is ours. Philip II was urged to prepare a maritime expedition to overthrow Elizabeth Tudor. There was much to be said in favor of this belligerent stance. Philip, uh, uh, although the number of English privateering raids was impressive, their achievements were not. Only Drake's circumnavigation had returned a respectable profit, and even then, perhaps three quarters of those who set out died on the voyage. More typical was the troublesome voyage of Edward Fenton in 1582, which was supposed to sail to the Moluccas by way of Cape Horn and bring home a rich cargo of spices, as Drake had done. It didn't quite work out that way. The chief pilot, Mr. Thomas Hood, was proud of the fact that he used neither compass nor quadrant. I give not a fart, he said, I give not a fart for all their cosmography, for I can tell more than all the cosmographers in the world. Not surprisingly, he guided his little fleet, not to the Moluccas, but first to Africa and then to the River Plate, where it was attacked by a Spanish squadron at a time when the crews were drunk. The damage sustained was so severe that most ships had to head back home while one steered into the coast of Brazil and was wrecked, delivering the men aboard to the native Indians who, so it was rumored, enslaved the fittest and ate the rest. These were hardly the hearts of oak who would fight and conquer again and again. These were hardly the ships and the men to wrest Columbus's legacies from Spain. 
Nevertheless, although all these comforting details of Fenton's failure were known to Philip II, he remained reluctant to contemplate a new strike against Elizabeth. In response to the urgings of Santa Cruz, he did commission a number of position papers and some cartographic surveys of the British coast, but his attention and his resources centred increasingly upon the spectacular progress of his armed forces in the Low Countries against the Dutch Revolt. Under the command of his genial and able nephew, Alexander Farnese, Duke of Parma, the Spanish army regained the key ports of the Flemish coast, above all Dunkirk and Newport, which you can see on the left of the map there, lower left, and some major cities of the interior, above all Bruges and Ghent, in 1584. In a daring decision, Parma decided next to reduce Antwerp, which you see at the very top Antwerpen of the map there. Antwerp was the largest city in northern Europe, its population probably a hundred thousand. Okay, that's not large to you, but remember in Champaign-Urbana we only are a hundred thousand, so it's a metropolis by my standards. It's anyway at this stage the largest city in northern Europe. Daring also because the strategy did not require any action against the walls of Antwerp, but rather bridges across the river, which you can see right in the middle of the slide, flooding of land, closing off the entire river network that led into the Schelt, which, lent, which connected Antwerp with the sea. As long as the siege of Antwerp lasted, and it lasted for a whole year, Philip II was not free to uh, act elsewhere. A fervent request from Pope Sixtus V in May 1585 to support another attack on Elizabeth by means of, quote, some outstanding enterprise, the Pope's phrase, seems to have caused particular irritation in the king, involved as he was in the siege of Antwerp. The king scribbled angrily on the back of this papal brief, doesn't the reconquest of the Low Countries seem outstanding to them? Do they never consider how much it costs? There's little to be said about the English idea. Why don't we just stick to reality? That's May 1585, and reality, as politicians keep telling us, is very relative. Within four months, important changes in the international situation had caused Philip II to change his mind radically about the Pope's invitation to conquer England. To begin with, in August 1585, Antwerp fell. Just like Santa Cruz's triumphs in the Azores, Palmer's victory caused an immediate wave of euphoria in Spain. But this time it didn't last. Dutch resistance continued unexpectedly and unabated, and hopes that the surrender of Antwerp would lead to a general pacification were soon dashed. But at the same time, events in France, remember France was at the centre of those Habsburg Purple Territories, Events in France played into Philip II's hands. The death of Francis, Duke of Anjou, in July 1584, created a major succession crisis in France, for it left Anjou's childless elder brother, Henry III, as the last of his line, the last of the Valois dynasty. Because of, it's called the Salic Law, the law that no one can inherit the French throne except through the male line, because of the Salic law, only heirs in the male line could succeed to the French throne, and Henry III's nearest male relative in the male line was Henry of Bourbon, King of Navarre, leader of the French Protestants. As such, he was totally unacceptable to the French Catholics who made up 90% of the kingdom's population. The Catholic militants therefore created a paramilitary organization known as the League, dominated by the Duke of Guise and dedicated to securing a Catholic succession. Guise promptly entered into an alliance with Philip II both to secure Spanish military assistance should war break out in France and to acquire Spanish funds to help keep the League's army prepared. A treaty which guaranteed both was signed in December 1584 and in July 1585 the Treaty of Namur forced the last of the Valois to declare war on the Protestants and to cede a number of important towns to Catholic control. For the first time since the end of the Hundred Years' War, 
Spain had absolutely nothing to fear from France. Philip was now free to do exactly what he wanted in Northern Europe, secure in the knowledge that France could do nothing to stop him. And at precisely this moment, when the king suddenly realizes his opportunity, his freedom, at precisely this moment, Elizabeth chooses to antagonize him in an unprecedented and direct way. On the 7th of October, 1585, a squadron of 33 English vessels, commanded by Sir Francis Drake, and including two warships from the Royal Navy, arrived off Bayona in Galicia, and passed the next 10 days raiding villages in the vicinity, desecrating churches and taking plunder and hostages. Now sailing into the Caribbean, or sailing around the world, and attracting Spanish ships and goods was one thing. To land on Spanish soil and commit hostile acts was quite another. It, it was an action which, in the 16th century, as today, could only be regarded as a casus belli. The responses of Spain's leaders varied. In Lisbon, the Marquis of Santa Cruz drew up a memorandum of necessary defensive preparations to prevent further attacks on the peninsula, to clear the seas of hostile vessels, to safeguard Spanish America against the possibility that Drake might continue his depredations there. But Santa Cruz's reaction was entirely defensive. What can we do to limit the damage? Others were far more belligerent. Don Rodrigo de Castro, Archbishop of Seville, was appalled by the pusillanimous character of the document, copies of which he claimed were circulating in the streets and squares of his city. And he complained directly to the king. What is the point? If you're an archbishop, you can talk to kings that way. What is the point of chasing after Drake, a fine sailor with a powerful fleet? Surely the best way to end the English menace is to attack England. And since Drake is probably heading for the West Indies, if we are going to undertake a campaign against England, there will never be a better time than this. The king read the letter and agreed. But on the back he wrote, yes, the decision has already been taken. It had indeed. On the 24th of October, shortly after learning of the events in Galicia, Philip II decided to accept the Pope's commission to undertake the conquest of England. The interlock between this sudden volte-face and the changed international situation emerges clearly from the impressive strategic analysis drawn up at this time by the minister responsible for foreign affairs in Spain, Don Juan de Zuniga. Zuniga identified four major enemies of Spain. The Turks, the French, the Dutch and the English. The Turks, Thuniga felt, although previously Spain's foremost problem, were now so tied down in their struggle with Iran, or as it was then called Persia, that it was enough simply to maintain a defensive posture in the Mediterranean. The French too, although once a major threat, were now so thoroughly mired in their own civil war that although it might be necessary to intervene at some stage in order to prolong them, the cost was unlikely to be high. This left the other two, the Dutch and the English. The Dutch, it is true, said Thuniga, had been a thorn in Spain's flesh since the rebellion broke out in 1572, because every Spanish success seemed to be followed by some countervailing reverse. But at least the, volume, fall, at least the problem, although costly and humiliating, remained confined to the Low Countries. The English menace, however, was quite different. It was new and it threatened the entire Hispanic world, for clearly Elizabeth supported Drake and the Dutch. Thuniga insisted that England had in fact openly broken with Spain and that, quote, to fight a purely defensive war is to court a huge and permanent expense because we have to defend the Indies, Spain and the convoys travelling between them. Exactly the argument advanced by the Archbishop of Seville. The most effective form of defence, said Thuniga, as well as the cheapest, was to attack England with an amphibious operation of overwhelming strength. It was possible that diverting resources to the enterprise of England might compromise both the reconquest of the Netherlands and also, temporarily, the security of Spanish America, but Thuniga felt that this was a risk worth taking 
because unless England were threatened directly, clearly no part of Philip II's empire would be safe again. The apparent wisdom of Thuniger's analysis was swiftly demonstrated. On the one hand, the Duke of Parma reported a massive build-up of English forces in Holland, paid for by English subsidies, culminating in December 1585 with the arrival at Flushing, the port you see there, of a little fleet, and those of you who are either near the front or particularly sharp-sighted will detect the flag of St. George flying on those little ships. The arrival at Flushing of a fleet commanded by Elizabeth's chief minister, the Earl of Leicester, who was sworn in as Governor-General of the rebellious provinces later in December 1585. On the other hand, a constant stream of information poured back to Spain on the destruction caused by Drake. As you see, he leaves Plymouth in the top right of the map. He goes down, putting it at Galicia to rape a few nuns, destroy a few images, take a little hostages. Then he goes to the uh, Canary Islands, the Cape Verde Islands, straight across to the Caribbean, he sacks Cartagena de Indias, he sacks Santo Domingo, he sails up to Florida and sacks Front Augustine, and then he reinforces the English colony at Roanoke. By the beginning of the year 1586, few of Philip II's subjects doubted that a direct attack on England was the only way to preserve the security of Spain, the Netherlands, the Americas, the Spanish Lake, in short, the Colombian legacy. But, it's one thing to decide that England must be invaded, it's quite another to make it happen. Given England's traditional strength by sea, experience has shown that there are actually, until the era of aerial warfare, the age of aerial warfare, there are only four ways to invade. The first is demonstrated on the rough sheet in front of you. That's to say, a simultaneous combined operation by a navy strong enough both to defeat the opposing English navy and to shepherd across the channel an army sufficient for rapid conquest. This was tried twice successfully, once by William I, William the Conqueror in 1066, and again by William III, the glorious deliverer, in 1688. It was attempted unsuccessfully by France twice, in 1759 and 1779. So that's strategy one, the direct attack in overwhelming strength, either from the Netherlands or from France. The second possible strategy is to assemble an army in secret somewhere near the channel and then send out a fleet from some other port as a decoy either to lure, to lure away the Royal Navy so that a convoy of light and nimble transports could ferry the army across the channel unescorted. And that is the ploy favoured by Napoleon in 1804 and 1805. So that's plan two. Plan three, the third possible strategy, is a variant of this to launch a diversionary attack on Ireland which would lure away England's main defensive forces leaving the mainland relatively open to invasion. The French attempted this with partial success in 1760 and with very considerable success in 1798, the year of the French. Finally, I said there were four alternatives and this is the fourth one. It was theoretically possible to make a surprise assault at a time when England was unprepared as the French yet again were to attempt yet again unsuccessfully in 1743 and 1744. Any apparent anti-French bias in this lecture is I assure you entirely accidental. It is a tribute to the excellence of Philip II's advisers that all of these possibilities were given consideration in the 1580s. It is a condemnation of his methods of strategic planning that in 1587-8 to eight, he tried to undertake three of them at once. The king began by inviting his two leading commanders, the Duke of Parma in the Netherlands and the Marquis of Santa Cruz in Lisbon, 
to devise war plans for the conquest of England. Not surprisingly, both men cast themselves in the starring role. Palmer advocated a surprise attack from the Netherlands with a large army transported one dark night from the coast of Flanders to the coast of Kent under his personal command. That's strategy four. Santa Cruz called for an amphibious assault in overwhelming strength from Lisbon, naturally under his command, to the Irish coast where a diversionary landing would be made and then on to the coast of southeast England. The third alternative strategy. Neither commander really noticed any possible role for the other, and when the plans arrived at court in the course of 1586, the king, in some perplexity, turned the dossier over to his trusted adviser, Don Juan de Zuniga, for comment. And Zuniga, in turn, consulted a priest. It's one of those strange factors in Spanish history that obscure men, dressed in black, appear from time to time as advisors at the most senior level, I'm sure it doesn't happen in the United States, I'm positive it never happens in Britain, but people of whom you've never even heard turn out to have shaped public policy to an extraordinary degree. This man, as it says, is Bernardino de Escalante. And the archives of Philip II's government are full of papers written by obscure clerics like Escalante, which later turn into policy. He was born in Laredo, son of a prominent naval captain. He had sailed to England with Philip II in 1554 and spent 14 months there before enlisting as a soldier in the Spanish army of Flanders. He then returned to Spain, went to university and evidently studied geography as well as theology for he later wrote two excellent treatises on navigation. He also served as an inquisitor, first in Galicia and then in Andalusia until in 1581 he became majordomo to the far-eating Archbishop of Seville whom we've already met, Don Rodrigo de Castro. Over the next 20 years, Escalante sent no less than 22 papers of advice to the king, the second of which, concerning the invasion of England, clearly bore the stamp of the Archbishop's aggressive attitude. Escalante reviewed the various alternative strategies in detail and even drew a campaign map which is the only campaign map I've ever seen from a 16th century source. I believe you're seeing it here for the first time tonight. It's certainly the only one concerning the enterprise of England that has come down from us, come down to us. Now, it's a complicated map. It's not easy to understand, but what Escalante does in this is to show the different routes by which you could attack England. One would be to leave Lisbon, go around the north of Scotland and land there, which he says, not a smart idea. Secondly, you could go up to Ireland or Milford Haven, which he said would be good. Third is to go right up the channel, but as he says uh, in the commentary uh, in, as written in the North Sea, el pa este paso es peligroso. It's a dangerous crossing because this is where the English fleet will be. He's a little out of date. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, if you look at the two lines, it says, Aeste se llaman ye great tower, ye great tower. So, you know, he's, he's heard English, but he's never seen it written, and he doesn't understand it. And that's what he thinks the Tower of London looks like. And according to Escalante, that's really the major obstacle. If you can take that, you can take the rest. Briefly stated, uh, Escalante uh, combines the strategies advanced by Santa Cruz and Palma. He says, don't do one majesty, do them both. A grand fleet of 120 galleons and merchantmen, plus galleasses, galleys and pinnaces, together with an army of 30,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry, should be concentrated in Lisbon and then launched against either Waterford in Ireland or Milford Haven in Wales. Waterford and Milford Haven are in fact both on that map, but you would never recognise their location uh, by uh, correspondence with modern maps. At the same time, the army of Flanders was to be reinforced, first to tie down Leicester and the English expeditionary force in Holland, and then to cross the Channel in, in small ships in preparation for a surprise march on London, while Elizabeth's forces were occupied elsewhere. This ingenious scheme, backed up by a wealth of detail on the political and physical geography of the British Isles, clearly convinced Don Juan de Zuniga, who had never been to England, 
and he certainly didn't read English, because his letter of advice to the king largely reiterated Escalante's plan. He merely added the observation that, quote, since Spain would gain no advantage from the direct annexation of England because of the cost of defending it, the newly conquered realm should be bestowed upon a friendly Catholic ruler. He, of course, suggested Mary Stuart, now a counter-reformation paragon, but recommended, just to be on the safe side, that she should marry a more dependable Catholic prince, such as the Duke of Parma. Luckily for him, Parma never found out what was envisaged. The king, too, was convinced because, in July 1586, a new master plan was sent both to Brussels and to Lisbon, commanding the concentration of forces for a dual assault on the Tudor state. A formidable armada would sail from Lisbon, that's number one, carrying as many troops as could be mustered, together with most of the equipment, above all a powerful siege train, needed for the land campaign, and it would sail directly to Waterford. There it would put ashore assault troops and secure a beachhead. This, it was expected, would distract Elizabeth's naval forces and thereby neutralize their potential for resistance when, after two months, and no more than two months, the Armada suddenly left Ireland and moved around to the Channel. At that point, and not before, the main invasion force of 30,000 veterans from the Army of Flanders would embark on the flotilla of, our, of small ships assembled in the ports of Flanders and, under Palmer's personal command, make a surprise attack on the coast of Kent, while the Grand Fleet cruised off the North Foreland and secured local command of the sea. Palmer's men, together with some reinforcements and the siege train from the fleet, would then make a dash for London and seize the city and a great tower, preferably with Elizabeth and her ministers still in it. I've often wondered whether Philip II realised the full implications of this plan. In retrospect, there was much to recommend Santa Cruz's proposal. The events of 1588 were to prove that once they got their armada to sea, the Spaniards experienced little difficulty in moving 60,000 tons of shipping from one end of the channel to the other, despite repeated assaults upon it. And the Kinsale, language, uh, the Kinsale landing of 1601 showed how easily a bridgehead in southern Ireland could be secured and fortified. Likewise, Palmer's concept of essentially a blitzkrieg landing in Kent without any warning also had much to recommend it. Time and again, his troops had proved their invincibility under his leadership, and it is hard to see how the largely untrained English forces taken by surprise could have successfully resisted the army of Flanders as it marched on London. The Armada's undoing and the loss of Spain's Atlantic hegemony was ultimately caused by the decision to unite the fleet from Spain with the army from the Netherlands as the essential prelude to invasion. Why did they do it? Zuniga had played an outstanding role in coordinating the naval campaigns of the Mediterranean for almost 20 years. He might have been expected to see the dangers inherent in his plan. And Philip II had also been party to many victorious campaigns in the past, most notably the conquest of Portugal and the Azores between 1580 and 1583, which had also been combined military and naval operations. But perhaps he felt that two simultaneous attacks were more likely to succeed than one, and that since there seemed to be money enough for both, why not? Why choose between them? Philip II was, after all, essentially an armchair strategist. In no first-hand experience of any form of strategic planning, technical, tactical, operation, theatre or grand, they were all a closed book to him. Worse still, much worse still, he wouldn't allow anybody else to fill these critical gaps. That picture, by the way, is from 1588. Again, I think you're... Uh, no, it's in the Armada book, but it was found by chance. It's actually in a plea for tax exemption. Uh, a, a local noble gentleman wishes to establish 
his outstanding parentage and puts a little book of hidalgia, of nobility, together. Because if you're a nobleman, you don't pay taxes. You get right off. So he has this flattering portrait of the king as he appeared in 1588. And at the same time says, please, majesty, I know you're hard up, but so am I, so why don't you just give me exemption from the IRS? You might try it on your local tax office, but I don't think it will have any more success uh, than Barrio Nuevo, who made that little picture. Philip II had a very secretive system of government. It's been called a system of confusion and rule because he ensured that no one else ever knew as much as he did. Nobody else ever subjected his plans to critical scrutiny. Thuniga, who had both the authority and the knowledge to raise objections, died in the autumn of 1586 and none of the king's other ministers, not even, or perhaps not especially, those involved in executing the plan, were allowed to demand how precisely two large and totally independent forces, with operational bases separated by more than a thousand miles of ocean, could achieve the precision of time and place necessary to effect their link-up. There's no planning meeting at which Santa Cruz and Palmer are allowed to say, yes, Majesty, splendid plan, but just tell us one more time, how exactly do we get together? We didn't catch it the first time round, would you just tell us again? No, they get their orders and are told to shut up. The campaign commanders were not allowed to require an explanation, either of how the vulnerable and lightly armed barges in Flanders would be able to evade the Dutch and English warships, or insist that there should be a fallback strategy. There is no fallback strategy in case the junction of the two main components of the plan proved to be impossible. Still, one mustn't be too hard on Philip II. One must remember that his grand design came within an ace of success. In the summer of 1588, According to a slightly simplified version of Thuniga's plans, simplified because the Irish dimension has been omitted, a grand fleet of 125 vessels carrying some 18,000 soldiers, the greatest and strongest combination that ever was gathered in Christendom, as even an Englishman observed, sailed from Spain and on the 6th of August, 1588, dropped anchor off Calais. You can see it off Calais, you can see the coast of Dover, you can see the Spanish Armada gathered before Calais and the English fleet waiting for it. The 6th of August, only, 12, only 25 miles away, the 30,000 veterans of the Army of Flanders had begun to embark on the ships and barges prepared for them in the harbours of Dunkirk and Newport and from their anchorage where they received welcome provisions from the benevolent Catholic governor of Calais the men aboard the fleet could almost make out the designated landing place just south of Ramsgate where the Romans, the Saxons and the Danes had all landed successfully in the past. With England diplomatically isolated and with France in friendly hands, anything could have happened at this point. And for the next 36 hours, for all of the 7th of August, until the daring English fireship attack which disordered the fleet's combat order, and the even more daring English close-range uh, close gunnery assault, the fate of the Western world hung in the balance. Had either of the English stratagems miscarried, had either the fireships not disordered the fleet, or the gunnery assault not succeeded in driving the armada into the North Sea, there would have been time for Palmer to march his forces to the waiting fleet. Or had there been a sudden change in the wind blowing the Dutch blockade squadron off station, Palmer's flotilla, perhaps escorted by the heavily gunned shallow draft galleasses with the armada, could have put to sea. In either case, it's hard to see how an independent Protestant England could have survived the onslaught of the forces marshalled by Philip II. The potential consequences of a Spanish victory in 1588 can hardly be overstated. For had England been conquered and Catholicized, the Dutch revolt would swiftly have collapsed, while with France controlled by a grateful Catholic League and entirely surrounded by Habsburg states, it too would surely have become a Spanish satellite. There would have been no North European colonies in North America, 
Portugal and her empire would have been gradually integrated into a single Iberian superstate. Van Diemen and Cook would have claimed Australasia for the Catholic Church. And more practically, we would have celebrated Columbus Day on October the 23rd, according to the Gregorian calendar, instead of 11 days too early. But of course, it didn't happen that way. The tactical flair of Elizabeth's admirals and the technological superiority of her ships produced a different outcome. Instead of the victory he expected, restoring to his empire the security and prosperity that had been under threat for 20 years, Philip II's overambitious enterprise, which culminated in the destruction of more than half his fleet and the death or disgrace of almost all his senior naval officers, provoked a succession of ever larger raids on Spain's Atlantic shipping and overseas colonies by the English and slightly later by the Dutch. I therefore have a modest proposal that Armada Day, August the 8th, the moment at which Spain finally forfeited Columbus's legacy should be declared a national holiday because it laid America open to invasion and colonization by the North Europeans. It destroyed the Colombian legacy and thus made possible that epic event in the history of mankind, the creation of the United States. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Professor Parker would be willing to uh, answer some questions. Perhaps some you would like to ask them. Dean Cox. I take it that, that uh, you see no problems for Parma after landing in Britain. That everything would be smooth sailing. Well, the sailing is the problem. Getting across the channel was his greatest obstacle. Once he had got his troops ashore, I cannot see what would have stopped him. Uh, he had 30,000 troops. I've been doing some further research into this and it's clear that he had 30,000 men which is a very considerable army and they were all or almost all veterans. They had seen a great deal of military experience. Their corps had been professional soldiers for 10, 15, 20 years. Ranged against them were a considerable number of English troops. Again, recent research suggests more than at first had been suspected, maybe 40 or 50,000 English troops. But men who'd been recruited days before. Mobilization is very, very late in England. It's enormously expensive, as we all found during the Gulf War. It's enormously expensive to mobilize troops. And it was no cheaper in the 16th century. And so Elizabeth delayed until the last possible moment the mobilization of her forces. She had three armies, one of them in the north, in case, if you remember that Escalante plan, in case the Armada landed in Scotland and came south, she had to have an army up there. She had a second army which was shadowing the Armada's progress up the south coast in case they put ashore at Plymouth or Portsmouth or on the Isle of Wight. And a third army around her and based on Tilbury in Essex. Between them, this is probably 40 or 50,000 men, but none of them, none of them had seen military service before. The only troops at Elizabeth's command who had seen active service were actually windbound in Flushing in Zealand, trying to get back. So, point number one, Elizabeth had no experienced troops to place in the way of, as the Earl of Leicester said, the best troops at this day in Christendom. So the odds there are unequal. If you look at the uh, military geography of southern England, Escalante had it right. The only fortification of substance between Ramsgate and London is the Tower of London. And the Tower of London is not fortified in the modern way. Palmer has a siege train on the Armada of 50 pounder cannons. He's got 12 of them. With the aid of that and his 30,000 veterans, I don't think there's any doubt that he would have been able to reduce the Kingdom of England and I think had he reduced London who would have gone on fighting? I mean what would they fight for? Elizabeth has no successor her designated successor will be James VI and I but he is not actually designated until after she dies so what are the English to fight for? They know what they're fighting against they don't know what they're fighting for I don't really see them coming out to fight on the beaches and fight in the streets 
for Elizabeth Tudor if she's alive and certainly not for Elizabeth Tudor if she's dead and certainly not for what even at the time people called the new religion by 1588 the Reformation is just 30 years old in its Elizabethan form it's a pretty weak formula to die for so I think probably most people would have stayed at home wondered what how would have happened next Philip II had it all planned out Palmer was to take London Cardinal William Allen, leader of the English Catholic exiles, would have become the interim ruler in London. Mary Stuart was dead, and therefore the investiture of England would in fact have gone to the king's daughter, Isabella, who would have been married to some suitable, probably Habsburg relative, probably the Archduke Albert, the man she actually did marry. The Habsburgs are terribly keen on interbreeding. Um, really, only Habsburgs are good enough for Habsburgs, and, uh, uh, which creates problems. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not joking. Uh, uh, Don Carlos, Philip II's son, who is insane, whereas you and I probably have eight great crown parents, he had three. In other words, the same ones over and over again. And whereas you and I have 16 great great grandparents, he only had seven. So uh, I do mean that the Habsburgs like each other uh, when it comes to marriage. So Isabella would almost certainly have married one of them. But the situation would have been set up. Um, it's, it's like uh, counterfactual history is rather like putting your hand into a, a, a jar of marbles. You know, you take a couple of marbles out, they all rearrange themselves, and you don't really know how it would have been. But I cannot see what would have stopped Palmer had he got across the channel. And what's more, people at the time said the same thing. So Walter Raleigh, who was, as um, he himself once observed, the most hated man in England, nevertheless was a very shrewd judge and in his history of the world composed in the Tower of London in the earlier 17th century he said that if the Duke of Parma had got ashore there was really nothing that could have stopped him and Raleigh was there he was actually a member of Elizabeth's army and he himself felt that had the Spaniards got ashore there really was nothing England could have done to have stopped them they lacked the troops and they lacked the technology which alone could have arrested the conquest of England no, um, <clears throat> his daughter Isabella becomes quite important. Uh, when she fails to become Queen of England, he tries to make a Queen of France. And then in the end he gives her the Netherlands. But on the whole, I think he sees it as a, a, a loose confederation. Uh, in which France would simply become a satellite. He was quite happy with um, Henry of Navarre's uncle, the Cardinal de Bourbon, uh, because he was a Catholic. Most, but not all, cardinals at this time are. There are some cardinals um, um, who, are, who are Protestants but keep the title. Uh, and when they marry, their wives are called Madame la Cardinale. Anyway, uh, this particular cardinal is a, is a Catholic, um, but of course as a cardinal it's unlikely he will have a numerous uh, progeny, and if numerous it will not be legitimate, so you get the problem later on. Uh, he didn't think that far ahead, but he did, I think, see um, two scenarios very concretely. He did feel that if England was knocked out of uh, the anti-Habsburg order, then the Netherlands would be subdued. He did believe that if the Netherlands were reunited, then it would be possible to re-establish Habsburg control in the empire and above all, Catholic control in the empire. This is something which is attempted in the 1620s by the Emperor Ferdinand II, uh, with some success. And I think it would have happened in the 1580s. The 1580s is really when you see the beginnings of a more militant Catholic position. Uh, the doctrine cuius regio eius religio is actually a Catholic one and it's first formulated in the 1580s you get the war over Cologne which is the first real attempt to prevent the Protestantization of a new state and I think Philip would simply have reinforced that struggle so that the uh, German uh, uh, Germany would have once again become a more dependable uh, uh, Habsburg uh, uh, state beyond that uh, curiously enough what he really dreams of is reconquering Jerusalem after all, his title is King of Jerusalem. There's a very uh, amusing exchange between the Duke of Parma and uh, a man called Valentine Dale, who is an English ambassador sent to the Netherlands to discuss peace. And uh, at uh, one point, Parma says, uh, perhaps, Dr. Dale, you'd like to discuss uh, matters in French, seeing your mistress claims to be Queen of France. It's 
one of the titles that the English crown has inherited from the Middle Ages. No, no, says Dale, I would much prefer to discuss in Hebrew since your master claims to be king of Jerusalem. Uh, it doesn't get him anywhere, but uh, it's a nice, a nice exchange. But Philip II takes that title very seriously. And if he has a further um, strategy, if he has a hidden agenda, it is, I think, to reunite the forces of Christendom and to go on a crusade. One tends to think of Charles V as the last crusader. But it's clear that this is something to which many European rulers subsequently aspire. Louis XIV also toys with the idea of going to Hungary to lead a crusade in person against the Turks in the 1670s and 80s, and only desists when the beastly king of Poland, Jan Sobieski, does it first. So this is uh, a traditional mantle, if you like, to be donned by the spiritual leader, the moral leader of Europe, and Philip II certainly sees himself in those terms. Also, he is a providentialist. He does believe that God will provide. He believes that he enjoys a special providence, as indeed most rulers of the day believe. Elizabeth also believes, Protestants and Catholics alike believe, that they have a special providence. And I think there comes a point beyond which his plans are subsumed into the divine purpose for Christendom. I found this summer a document from Philip II's pen in which he has heard of the fall of Tunis to the Turks in 1574, one of the um, points I mentioned in my presentation this afternoon on the military revolution. And Philip II's reaction to this news is very interesting. He doesn't just doesn't say, oh my God, what's happening? He says, I think this is the end of the world. And if not the end of the world, it's very close to it. And if it's very close to the end, he loves conditionals. If it's very close to the end of the world, let us hope that it's the end of the whole world and not just the end of Christendom. That's a very interesting sentiment from a counter-reformation ruler. And it shows that he really identifies himself with God's purpose for Christendom in particular and with a sort of Catholic or Christian hegemony in general. So it's a rather long-winded answer to your question because it's not an easy question to um, pin down. He never specifically writes, Here's, here is my blueprint for empire. It would be very easy, my job, I mean, I would have given a five-minute presentation instead of a 55-minute presentation, if he'd ever penned down his, my, my views for Congress, a sort of Mein Kampf. Uh, but he never does, and you have to pick it out of these horribly uh, uh, spidery scrawl documents. But as far as I can tell it, the only specific goals he has are take England and the Netherlands will follow. Take the Netherlands and Germany will come back into our orbit. And after that, God will provide. And as far as I can tell, his idea would be then to lead the united forces of Christendom on the reconquest of the Holy Land and the liberation of the Holy Sepulchre. I hope that hasn't intimidated you. I can give brief answers to questions.